Right. Um, so we've got 45 minutes now, and um, I just wanted to kick it off um, a little bit, and then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. So we'll start thinking what you'd like to ask. Um, one of the things that um, came through a little bit is, is uh, in all of your conversations, is that link between government, legislation, and, and moving forward. Um, and particularly, Mark, you spoke about this issue of, of nimble policy and, and how we need to change policy. And I'm just wondering if um, if you can maybe touch a little bit more on what, what does that really mean in, in, in practice in terms of having that nimble policy? Because obviously our, our, our legislators, particularly in government, have got a whole host of things. They've got Brexit to worry about. They have a lot of those things which, as you say, won't, won't necessarily matter 20, 20 years, 30 years' time. Um, how do you see that working? Well, I mean, if you think about how much technology and, and how much even kind of best practice decision-making tools, human tools, are used in that process, there's a long way from, if you look at the best organizations in the world, how they make the best ideas surface and how quickly they deal with the best ideas, there's a huge gap in potential between how the system, decision-making system of community, because ultimately we're all part of that decision-making system, how that works compared to what's possible. And that gap's getting wider every day. So somehow we need to actually, you know, ultimately, if, if you imagine um, how policy is the operating system for government, um, you know, I've got a phone in my pocket that updates, or my Chromebook updates every six weeks. That operating system changes. The government operating system, which is legislation and policy, we're on 10-year update cycles, maybe. And we need to be, and that was before the smartphone, essentially. Um, we need to be on update cycles that are running in terms of weeks, and everything else feeds from that. And Colin, what do you think about that challenge? Well, this, I suppose this is a bit of a sort of Damocles hanging hang over my head now, which is, you know, the structure of government is the structure of government we have. Um, and, and it's not for myself as a civil servant role to turn around and say whether that structure is right or wrong. You know, it's for yourselves as business leads. I think uh, Deputy Lyndon Trott said that at the IOD, which is, you know, if you don't like it, step up and, and get, become part of it. You know, um, um, I'm quoting him, not my own personal view, of course, at that point. You know, and I think... Um, um, uh, Doug Perkins said, actually, what I'd want is, you know, it's 30 Gavins um, in, the, uh, in the States. It is what it is, you know. Um, and has it seen us through some difficult times in the past? Yes, it has. Has it at certain times been able to make very, very quick decisions, which sometimes we forget about? And, and the one perhaps I'd pick is the, uh, when the fuel tankers had to be bought at, at very, very short notice. So it can, if it feels, and the island feels it has the need to do so. The question is, is how do you drive that need to do quickly? You know, the you know the debate on the um, Landquest Seawall, which is very close to where I live, you know, I, I thought was really, really interesting because it mattered to a lot of people. And I think it goes back to some of the points in the Dandelion Project. If, if it matters to a lot of people, it will develop a lot of political debate. It's not our position to sit here and go, well, it should matter to people because actually that's not the point. It either does or it doesn't. Graham, obviously you're in a highly regulated uh, uh, sector. What's your experience to date in this? Well, I, I, I think that um, it's a real challenge to get um, governments to think about the future. And, and, and although Mark had some sort of nice graphs about how things are changing sort of exponentially, I think most folks' experience uh, is, is we are as... as uh, citizens a little bit like kind of frogs in the proverbial kind of cold bath of water being warmed up slowly and however fast it's being warmed up and and and, and uh, really what we're talking about is change happening around us so fast that by the time we notice it it's too late to do anything about it so i i was very encouraged by what colin was saying about um the predictive modeling that's gone on and about the government using some of the big data analytics here in Guernsey to try and look out 30, 40 years in the future and understand what's going to happen and start to make decisions now before it's, it, it's too late. Um, so I, th I think that um, government has to do that. And I think the kind of key thing for government is to try and look out. Government really should be looking out over decades and trying to build a framework that then, as businesses and citizens, we can operate in. So I'm, I'm not sure I agree completely with what Mark says about sort of, if you like, 
uh, maybe this is not quite you meant, what you meant, Mark, but changing legislation every six weeks, because actually <clears throat> I want some stability. But you know, what I want is I want a framework that looks out a couple of decades and which I can kind of um, operate in and which recognizes the way that the environment is changing. Um, let's open it up to the floor. Do we have any questions? Sasha. Um, thank you very much for very, very interesting um, presentations and for kind of answering the minds and actually showcasing. I must be wrong in this one, but I would say something that we have in the government because we're also probably not about to be aware of this topic and that's the issue of kind of climate emergency and so forth and governments and leaders and policymakers. Where I see a possible kind of massive disconnect is. Sasha. Interrupt you. We're gonna because we've got it live streamed. We're gonna put you on mic. Thanks. Exactly. Can you? Is it on? I don't think it's on. Yeah, it's on. Do you want me to start again? That's all right. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Um, where I, I feel I see a massive disconnect is currently between some of the policy and visioning that is being set, and it's fascinating, and with the actual skills, digital skills at, at all levels of our society from, you know, starting from primary schools, secondary schools, but more importantly from actual digital skills and the cultural the ability to culturally adapt uh, to, to what's coming across obviously our professional community. And this came, I think, very strongly at the IOD debate as well. It's where, you know, we have very few, uh, uh, you know, teenage kids uh, learning ICT skills and they're teaching the teachers, right, themselves. And some of the things that came from Mark Lenner on the, on the Twitter feeds, I think one computer science uh, graduate came back to Guernsey and there were about 15 in general actually studying abroad. And I'm not saying that coding is the only skill we need. We actually need, and I think Mark initially talked about the cultural shift. We need to be adaptive. We need to be learning as we go. And I feel we need a massive upskilling of our whole population at all levels to actually be able to to, to get out of the you know a warming up uh, pot uh, as frogs. And I see there's a massive disconnect about the amazing plants and actually the basic level of digital skills on the islands. And I work with lots of small and medium businesses at the moment in Guernsey, and I'm generally in shock about the lack of basic digital skills. I'm talking about, for example, an ability to open a Facebook page. This is still lacking in a lot of businesses uh, that are forming the foundation of our economy. So I wanted to ask you where, where, whether you see this bis massive gap where it feels we systematically need to keep upskilling our population. And this has to be part of just our ev everyday life education, mm -hmm training and development across well, everything pretty much. Thank you. I'll have a go, Mark. Um, so I think this is kind of one of the problems in terms of the way society actually does things. It very much focuses on the tools <coughs> rather than the why behind uh, why you do it. If you look at a, a self-directed, a kid that works in a self-directed learning model, which we don't yet have here, ultimately they already know what they want to achieve and they look to acquire the skills they need to achieve it, and because knowledge is, is democratizing, the barriers for them to be able to do it are doing all the time. Same with any adult. What we haven't really understood is why learn these skills. What do we need them for? What's our massive transformational purpose that we need as a community to acquire all this? There's one thing saying we need digital tools and digital skills, but unless it comes in the context of why do I want to give up my life as it is? Why do I want to make a change? Why do I want to do, want to do something scary? It's very difficult for people to make the leap. And I think this is what's really missed in society, in the education model as a whole, is kids don't really get told why they're learning what they're learning. Um, and understanding that if they understand a deep sense of why and a deep sense of purpose, they will drive their own learning, they will pick up skills. And I think this is fundamentally what's missing in society right now in terms of how we position things. We've got to start with why. Okay, I, I, look, although I'm responsible for a business here in Guernsey, I don't live in Guernsey, I live in Jersey. And I think you guys are too harsh on yourselves. Uh, I, um, uh, JT was involved in rolling out uh, uh, fiber connectivity to the schools in Guernsey two or three years ago. And at the end of that project, I was privileged to go around a couple of schools with the education minister at the time and see what kids were doing. And actually, I was blown away. Um, and I wished that my own kids who were at school in Jersey were getting the same experience over there, frankly. Um, 
And, and, and just to give you one little example of one of the things I saw, that the connectivity that we just put in place was enabling. The kids were learning history, but the way they were doing history, and it was quite, I, I'm, I'm sure that this was set up just for me as a telco guy, <laughs> but they, had, they were doing um, a sort of episode Dragon's Den, and um, it was about, uh, imagine you were a character from history and you were pitching your idea to the dragons. And they'd chosen Alexander Graham Bell, and he was pitching the telephone to these sort of dragons. And it was all done on video, and they were sharing the video. The connectivity meant they could share the videos and so on. And I just thought, what a terrific, innovative way of learning history, of making it interesting. And actually, they, the, the, the kids were learning huge amounts of digital skills, but they weren't having it sort of thrust down their throats as, you know, here now, let's, let's see how you can take a video and, and post it to Facebook. They were actually learning history, and the digital stuff was, a, was an enabler for that. And, and I think that, um, uh, actually, you're doing a great job. And I think that, um, that there is a challenge for us all in that our young people are very au fait with social media, uh, that they're getting some terrific digital skills training in the schools. And there's an element that we have to be patient and let that generation work its way through to the workforce. And a challenge for us in industry is to actually take some of our younger people and give them opportunities uh, and seniority in a way beyond their years. So I would argue that the skills are out there, but to be honest, they're probably not amongst those of us that have got gray hair in this room. They're amongst the sort of millennial generation who, by the way, are incredibly challenging and difficult to recruit, I know, because I try to recruit in the time, and even worse, sort of retain. So I, I'm, I'm not sort of in the kind of all is... Um, all is death and doom and um, despondency. I think the potential and the people actually exist on the island. It's up to us as senior leaders in the room to reach out to the millennial generation who have those skills, who are being taught it in the classrooms in Guernsey and, um, uh, and pull them in and put them in important roles in, in, in our companies. I think I'll reiterate some of those. Uh, I mean, first I said, I'll go back to give a call out again, is, is Lucy with him, who's in educational technologist, which probably wouldn't use that sort of terminology, uh, but now sits within economic development because we see the importance of skills um, to drive every economy, not just uh, one that's digital. Going to Graham's point, you know, we now, in partnership with JT, have now got about one gigabyte intersite link between every school. We can't put it in fast enough, pretty much, for the children to start using it, you know, because every time we think we've beaten their expectation, they yeah. come up with something else. You know, uh, and therefore the the media, um, where they're, they're dealing with uh, media studies, is, is stripping out. Now, we, we're constantly, we now monitor it on a permanent basis. We can, you know, turn the tap up as and when necessary to do so. So I think an awful lot's going on. You know, there, there are some challenges in the economy. You know, I go back to the, I think it was, you know, one of, I don't know if it was 13 or 3, but, you know, people with, with engineering degrees are coming back. You know, what post does that person come into? You know, it's... There is a piece, and I've seen it mature over the IOD debates over the last three years, where we get these young people together, you know, and it's a case of, I'm going to go off and find my fortune elsewhere, and then recognise them, because I'm the worst case of this. You know, I did exactly the same thing, and then came back 18, 20 years later, and went, actually, Guernsey isn't too bad. You know, people do need to go away and experience some of the world, but we need to bring them back, possibly a little bit earlier, or provide them with those work opportunities that give them the better you know, better view of where they can go. The debate was one pupil turned around and said, well, I'm leaving Guernsey because I don't want to work in the, in the finance industry. Well, A, the finance industry, as we all know, is far more complex than just, you know, finance, whatever that is. You know, there are huge opportunities here. So, you know, how the businesses adapt, how the businesses put worth and promotion prospects into people who are fundamentally data scientists is some of the challenges. You know, how do you get to be the top of a a large bank here, you know, probably not being a data scientist. In 10 years' time, the route of being top of a bank is probably going to be being a data scientist. Okay. Any other questions? There you go. Hi, uh, hello. Oh, yeah. there we go. Uh, this is probably more for Colin than anyone else, um, but a lot of the discussion about digital infrastructure is focused around long-term efficiencies for government. Um, and I don't know how advanced a discussion is about uh, how much more money needs to be going into this sort of thing in order to uh, sort of 
say it's as important as upgrading the harbor, for example. Um, do you think? Do you think that's true? Do you think people uh, primarily see digital spend for the government as an efficiency thing or as a fundamental um, long-term infrastructure thing? I think it probably started as the former and is now seen more as the latter. So, you know, one of the um, challenges of the digital infrastructure is you don't see lots of cranes. Uh, I know that's all an obvious, you know, uh, and there is a sort of, you know, why is it important? It can't just be important because it has to be wider than that. But yes, you know, some of it was, you know, how can we drive efficiencies? You know, and that's a perfectly reasonable place because you as a citizen of Guernsey want to ensure that you know, I'm delivering those services better, faster, and for less tax pounds. That's a totally reasonable position to be in, and it's one you know, you know played out through the media on, on a regular basis. You know, waste is a big issue. But actually, I think you've seen a shift in the last you know, year or so, especially through the economic development digital framework and where it sits in the policy and resources plan, uh, you know, the phase one part of it, phase two comes out tomorrow with the budget, where digital infrastructure becomes critical. And I think the term that's been, I've heard from colleagues in economic development, is, you know, at the moment there are some um, challenges, don't want to underplay them, on, on air and sea links. In connectivity, there are some lower level challenges of today, and so you know, with JT we can turn the wick up, you know, on schools when we need to do so. What we need to ensure is that we have the confidence that we are in a good position going forward into the world of tomorrow. And it's not trying to, say, you know, play down any concerns on costs or, or connectivity to the island. I said, but I was talking to a, a, a friend from, um, I won't say where, because you'll probably get where it is, unfortunately. Uh, and they said, you, know, you don't understand how lucky you are. 97% uh, penetration of the entire public uh, and all residential properties to broadband. Could it be faster? Yes. How fast do you want it to be? But I think, to answer your question, yes, this was initially seen as an economic, um, you know, saving money for government, being more efficient, totally reasonable. But actually, in the last year or so, actually, this is an enabler. If we don't get this right, actually, a lot of the other things, you know, will, will go away. As someone said, you know, the you know, majority of the business, the 1.2 million SIMs that Graham mentioned, you know, those companies aren't flying to Guernsey to do that business. John Asia, I'm an intellectual property economist and also working with the UK's intellectual property body, IPAN. Um, Graham, you spoke about knowledge democratizing, but knowledge is also proprietizing. And I'd like to hear a bit more about where AI, IT, and IP come together. Because this is one of the critical aspects for an island of Guernsey. Do we really understand the strengths and weaknesses and what we need to do in our intangible knowledge infrastructure and how we can leverage that for the future? That's a really good question. I, 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 think, um, I think to sort of try and peel that question to pieces, I, I sort of try and chunk it up a level. Um, one of the things that's driving the internet economy, as, as you'll know, but uh, people need to sort of think about, is there is a deal that is going on. I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say it's a Faustian deal, but, it, but depending on where you st sit, uh, depends on your perspective on that. There is a deal which is essentially we are giving up our personal data to internet companies in return for getting something from them that is of value. I, I, I don't say we get something for free because it's not for free. We are getting access to Facebook. We are getting access to um, searches on Google. We're getting many things that are valuable. I mean, just think about how many apps you've all got on your smartphones and your iPads and so on, and how many of those apps are free. Uh, and then ask yourself, how are they being paid for? because it is true that there's no such thing as, as, as a free lunch. Now, um, so, so what is happening at the moment is I would argue that we as society, and sometimes people talk about millennials, but I think we're all guilty of it, we are giving up our, uh, our 
our own personal data for free and um, and we don't really think about it and you know which of us for example I've recently updated to iOS 11 on my iPhone um, did I read the 168 page <coughs> licensing agreement which no doubt essentially says that I've sold my soul to Apple and that they have complete right to use commercially all of the data that uh, and, and the widgets and the cookies and stuff that are on my iPhone for, for their own ends. I, to be honest, no, I didn't. I did what everyone else in this room did, which is I clicked, yes, I agree, and, and went through it. Now, now I think that the opportunity for... I think that if we get realistic, there is probably between 95 and 98% of the population for whom uh, they feel that's a good deal and they'll always feel it's a good deal. And I don't think that there's business for Guernsey there. But I do buy into an argument I had the other day. This isn't my. This isn't an original thought from me. I heard someone talking about it the other day. I wish I could remember who it was. I just can't. Which argued that for high net worths and very high net worths, the kind of people that, um, in fact, I think it was uh, at the pre-meeting yeah. for this, wasn't it? Um, for high net worths and pre net and very high net worths, ultra high net worths, there is an argument that there is an awful lot of value in their own um, personal information. I mean, just think of one example. If you are a billionaire, do you want someone to be freely able to buy the tracking information for your iPhone or even worse, your child's iPhone when you might be worried about something like kidnap risk? Yeah? And if you were that kind of individual might you be persuaded to pay for Google and Facebook and Apple services and stuff in a different context uh, rather than have your information kind of freely available to organizations that might include um, cyber criminals and so on and so forth? I think you might. There was a persuasive discussion and argument we had. Now, the real challenge for us is at the moment, Apple, for example, don't give you two license options. They don't say, here's the free option and here's the premium option and you know, if you pay an extra £1,000 a year for your iPhone, we'll do this. I think that market does exist and I think that's sort of the opportunity for Guernsey and I think a real challenge for us in a way is to make the market because it's to go along to a lot of these kind of internet giants and so on and actually regulators around the world and sort of almost insist that uh, individuals, members of society have the right to have privacy and have a mechanism to get these, are not excluded from these digital services, but can pay for them themselves if they so choose. I hope I... Yeah, yeah and I think um, what we need to understand is that they're currently making their money or business models out of grabbing our attention. Um, and I think in 10, 20 years' time, we're going to see that, that, that business models based off that is like as bad as cigarettes or or, <laughs> or sugar and things like that and understanding that, that, that fundamentally without some kind of regulation that, that starts to deal with the downstream cost of the way that there isn't such thing as a free lunch because ultimately society is paying, paying for the mental health cost bill mm. and the physical health cost yeah. bill of people's attention being distracted all the time. And this is why I say the neuroscience element of this. But also in terms of IP and things like that, we're moving forward to a much wiser society and democratization of wisdom. So this whole scarcity-based thinking in terms of I need to protect everything, it'll be interesting to see how we evolve as a species beyond that and understanding that the fastest growing organizations right now are probably the ones that are giving the most away. Um, and, and we have to understand that there's this, there's this link between understanding these, these kind of neurological dynamics that we have uh, as we become wiser in terms of how our systems change to actually adapt to that. I think the challenge, I'll really take actually one of Graham's points, is there is no such thing as a free dinner. We all know that. that there's, I think there's a balance coming between the people who want access to things like Facebook, Snapchat, and these, but at the same time, the ones to turn around and say, but I don't want you to have all my data. You know, well, actually, it, it, there's a bit of a binary choice there, guys. Um, I think there's a role for society to turn around and say, how much information can be given away for free? And how much should you pay to have less? But the, the, the situation where you turn and say, I want to use all these tools, but I don't want you to be, you know, Facebook is now the largest intelligence asset anywhere in the world. You know, 
you know, why every single time there's a criminal offence do people want to try and get into people's iPhones? Because the amount of data they hold on people's activities and movements. You know, but you can't have it both ways. You know, if you want to use Facebook, you give away certain, um, or you make the decision. There is a question on the GDPR, and I'll leave it for Emma to mention later. Of, do you know what you're giving away? And there's an issue about positive consent. But, you know, we, you know, there is a practical point, which is, I want to use it. Am I using the free version, you know, or am I paying for the premier version? You know, and people need to come around and accept the difference between those two. Does that lead to a point where you will have societal differences based on worth? Probably yes. Um, I think actually one of the opportunities, going with that, and I think Graham's totally right, there's a real opportunity there to provide those premium level services. And Guernsey, I think, is uniquely provided things like our database laws or data trustees, et cetera, et cetera, to provide that capability. But also, we have a duty, perhaps, to understand how do we do it to the 1.2 million subscribers that JT has globally. Because if you're a shop owner in Nigeria, you're probably not worrying too much about your security until you become wealthy enough to start worrying about it. One final thing, if I can add. There's another area that I worry about, and I don't speak about the bailwick governments either in Jersey and Guernsey in this, but in general for large governments, I worry that there is a conflict of interest between civil liberties and um, all, 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 all this data. So what Colin just said on sort of Facebook being this sort of great intelligence source, he's absolutely right on that. You know, if you're a government, uh, I mean, we, we see it. The UK government has huge projects that HMRC is running to basically collate as much personal information as they can on folks. And so they're, they're actually starting to try and work out, is your lifestyle... Um, uh, d d does the lifestyle that they can understand from all your social media match with the income that you're reporting to them to pay taxes on, just as, a, as, a, as an example. Um, and so you have to wonder, will how much are these big internet companies and large G7 governments in cahoots about wanting um, citizens to share all this data for free because ultimately governments are enacting laws which enable them pretty much at will to take whatever information they want and use analytics to analyze it. So I'm not talking about Jersey and Guernsey here, it's a bigger mm -hmm. issue. I, I, I just want to take that stage that once again, it's another opportunity for our islands. Mm -hmm. An appropriately governed and open and transparent government is a great place to live and work. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear all the time, you know, why do high net worth individuals come and live and, and contribute to Guernsey, Alderney and Sark society? Because it's a very low crime rate, our schools and education system is, is, is world class, our healthcare system is world class. There will come a fourth one when people realise it, is your data security is also world class. If you want to see the size of it, go and download the Interception Commissioner's report from the UK um, and see how many intercepts, legal intercepts, so there's nothing illegal here, are done in order to identify people who are lying about their address for school enrolment in the UK. Can I just touch on the, question, the, the, the high net worth issue, because that's obviously a USP for Guernsey in terms of the services that we've delivered over the years, and Millie touched on it at the beginning, the, you know, the trust industry is, is world class here um, and very international. If we, um, yet we look at pressure from outside to be very public with as much information as possible. Now we've sort of resisted that by um, coming up with a system that um, that makes sure that we have the information, but it's not widely open to the public, so you know, the sort of company registry piece. Um, where do you see, um, just touch a little bit more maybe on, on where the opportunities are for um, really protecting those high net worth individuals who, who have relied so, for ages on us, where, where is that going to go? I think it's going to be a, an ever increasing demand for transparency, um, either some of it um, driven by um, um, governments and things like that, also some have been driven by the external open source world of making things more transparent whether you like it or not. Um, I think it comes down to, to we talk about a lot in the last year around values and, 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 and what, is the, what are the industries you've built allowed to be built here and what are the values behind them. And I think if you focus on um, bringing the high net worths over here that have got the best values that are interested in changing the world rather than the lowest tax rate, 
um, are interested in contributing socially, um, you're build, building industries that, that focus on social contribution as, rather than taking from the world, then I think you can cope for much longer in a highly transparent world. I think we need to in integrate uh, values-based decision-making in all of our decisions. Otherwise, in a highly transparent world, we're going to come unstuck, as we already are with the tax haven label and, and things like that. And that creates more pressure, because ultimately, some of it isn't great from a values point of view. I think you know, some of the decisions I think Jennifer referred to is the register of beneficial ownership, which you know, we will have. And that agreement was made with the UK Prime Minister. But it, it's private. It's where we strike that balance between not being secretive, but being private, um, not giving information to everybody, but being transparent. And you know, Guernsey, I think, has always stepped that line very, very carefully. I think it's got the right balance. You know, it's how we take that forward into the realm of GDPR, you know, interception laws, etc., etc., etc. But these things are in demand. You know, as I said, the, the challenge will come. There, there is a an undercurrent of demand, uh, a lot of it in the UK, at the moment, a lot of the noise coming out from and, and reporting of things like the momentum movement from Labour, you know, you, you can either turn around and say that's, that's socialism and it's, it's equal justice, or it's the politics of envy, and where that takes us to, and therefore when people can make the decision, based on the SpaceX base to go anywhere in the world, where are they going to position themselves? I, I think... Just one little point to add on that, on, on what's happening in, with, with the UK. I'd like to look at Norway, because I think it's quite interesting what's happened there. So as everyone in the room probably knows, the Norwegians put all their tax returns online. Uh, and, and that caused quite a few problems initially. There was sort of stalking. There were kind of rich folks worried about kidnapping kids and everything. And the Norwegians did something kind of very sweet and smart, I think, which is in very much in this dem democratization of data stuff. They, the, the little tweak they made was all the tax stuff is all online, but now if you want to have a look at someone else's tax return, you have to register, and whoever's tax return it is that you've looked at, folks can see who, who it was that looked at their own tax return. And interestingly, that reduced the amount of people looking at each other's tax returns by about 95%, by about a factor of 20. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, I think, as Colin says, you can be very smart about sort of agreeing about private, but, but kind of available and stuff. But you can also be quite sort of smart in terms of opening things up. Again, look at the menace of social media in terms of trolling and so on and so forth. What would happen in social media if, it was, if you knew, actually, that when you uh, said something very nasty to folks, uh, actually it was very clear and there was a good link to say who it was that was saying that thing. Imagine if in the US election it had been clear from day one that the Russian state had been behind all those Facebook accounts that were sort of supporting um, Trump. And the technology sort of exists to do that today. So I think there, there you know, um, I think this is sort of what Mark's saying. There are innovative new things that we can do going forward to sort of solve the new innovative problems that these changes are creating. And the only thing I'll say is, and when those come along, say they exist now, you've got to be slightly cautious about how you deploy them. And Norway is a good example, because and I'm sure there must be a colleague from the Guernsey Press in here somewhere. Um, you know, if suddenly um, <coughs> every single person on the online your shout was outed for who they are, you know, that may cause issues. So you know, you need to think about how you deploy these when they come along. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We've got a couple in the back there. Thank you. Um, uh, we've heard a, a little about legislation keeping up with technology. Um, as, as an Alderney person, I just wanted to say uh, that Alderney can uh, sometimes legislate quite quickly. Uh, and we are, in fact, looking at niche markets. So if, if anyone here has an idea, then, you know, there's a jurisdiction out there that is, is kind of keen. <laughs> is there one more back there? <coughs> Great. Um, so, can I, can I take yeah. that? I, I tell you where Mr. Dent is coming from, which is, you know, we have a collection of islands. You know, if Guernsey as an island, or Alderney as an island, or Jersey as an island, doesn't get this right, someone else is going to. 
And therefore, you know, I would much prefer if Guernsey doesn't innovate quickly enough in legislation for someone goes to Aldney, you know, if they can't go to Aldney because Aldney doesn't legislate quickly enough, Perich have thought they can get a jersey. Awesome. But if they don't go to those three, <laughs> or so, but if they don't go to those, they're going to go to Singapore, or they're going to go to Isle of Man, or they're going to go to Luxembourg. So, you know, we are in a competitive environment, and we do need to adjust to the needs of business. Thank you. Uh, Mike Colville here. Um, it's quite a lot of things being touched on, and I think it's, it's interesting, going back to Sasha's point as well, about skills, and you talked about skills. Um, there is still this challenge about um, uh, supporting youth as they come through to become from problem solvers to innovators to entrepreneurs, and also that's a reflection on the businesses that already exist here. The reason I'm bringing this up, because I'm currently working with KPMG, and one of the first challenges they had was actually how do we start to demonstrate what innovation actually looks like? And that actually led to actually setting up a lot of internal projects themselves to actually facilitate more collaboration across the different areas. Do you see there's a challenge for business on the island about, well, we've got to take an attitude of fail fast, but we need to pick what we're going to fail fast at. They're small companies. How do they do this? How do they actually approach innovation? I think the challenge on everything is everyone knows the world's changing. Everyone knows we need to adapt. Every but very few people do it because it's scary. And, you know, this is a case of, and it's very easy to turn around and say, well, you need to understand your risk profile. And, you know, they're, they're all words. You know, actually, I think everybody needs to take a view from their business of where does it sit in its cycle? Is this the time for it to invest in innovation? Is it time for it to consolidate? You know, is it time to um, join with someone else? Is it time to get a fresh set of ideas in? You know, um, you know, the challenge in a lot of these companies is the core decision makers are the people who've, in certain areas of these areas, are perhaps, I'm going to be careful what I say here, but the ones perhaps least likely to make more radical decisions. You know, why are startups and these big companies driven by 28 year old, 30 year old people? Because, you know, they've gambled almost everything. You know, they've got nothing to lose. If you've got something to lose, that reduces your risk profile. Uh, the term, and I haven't used it in this uh, thing, uh, most of you probably know I used to be in the military. We used to have something called prism cells. It's a term I think was adopted in the GFSC um, and, uh, or, or red team. You know, you know, a team that will set aside to challenge the decisions you were making. Um, and it doesn't have to be expensive. You know, it can just be, some, you know, have someone, you know, separate to your board who just turns around and says, I get why, but what if? You know, um, challenge decisions, you know, because otherwise, you know, we will, you know, if you've got something to lose, it's risky. You will make a different decision. You know, I'm not saying everyone needs to be risk averse. I'm not saying everyone needs to be absolutely mad and just go for it. it depends where you are in your business cycle. But if you're not sure you're making the right decisions, you know, and there's a fair degree of introspective in there, is actually turn around and say, well, I'll get someone to come in independently, you know, sit in a few board meetings, have a bit of a nose around the organisation, and just challenge, have a bit of red teaming. Um, so building on what Colin says, and, and, and sort of what, what, what I do personally, um, is six to eight weeks after someone has joined JT, I do a welcome interview with them. And I sort of take the view that new people in the organisation see everything with fresh eyes. You know, they really can see the wood for the trees because they aren't uh, involved in the, or that, that they're not inculcated into sort of the organizational inertia uh, and, 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 and the way things get done. And uh, we've had a lot of good ideas for innovation in JT out of just listening to people, new folks from all walks of life, all, and I'm literally from the janitor up to new directors that come in and, and I actually ask them a simple question. What are the two or three things that you see here that are great compared with other organizations you work for, and what are the two or three things that are crap? And we kind of list the stuff that's crap, and we ask ourselves, you know, it's, 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 it's another way of doing what Colin's just sort of said, and because now we're big enough to have a fair number of folks sort of joining us, and it's um, lots of innovative ideas come out just by doing that. Um, I think this is kind of why, why I, I talk so strongly about cognitive bias. Um, and having coached so many people into entrepreneurship, I've 
of all ages, understanding the role that fear plays within that. Also the role that things like cost of living play in reducing the number of entrepreneurs you can create. I mean, societies without big what kind of safety nets now are actually putting themselves at competitive disadvantage. It's no surprise that actually the Nordic countries are probably generating more startups than most countries in the world because they've actually got the best welfare systems, the happiest and healthiest populations. When you understand the social narratives like you've got to own your home, you've got to have this, you've got to protect your kids, you've got to do all these kind of things, are actually in some ways stifling our ability to innovate and to create and that we need a different... And the truth is we probably wouldn't die here if you lost your job and things like that, but ultimately we're all holding on to things because of this neuroscience element, because our, our minds are designed for a different era. And this is why we really do need to create innovation. It really starts with people understanding their minds and how these biases are actually working so we can get more people to jump across the bridge. But, but it, it is painful. I mean, <laughs> and if we think it isn't painful, they're fundamentally cheating themselves. And, and this, for me, then comes down to a question of leadership in those organisations. Because at the end of the day, it, it is the C-suite who are held responsible for the bottom line of their companies. They are the ones who can affect change. So, you know, around this room now, you know, it's those people I'll be talking to. It's up to you, if you feel, you know, to challenge yourself and to affect change. You know, a slightly trite example, uh, and for reasons that were slightly opaque even to me, I've been running the project to exit education from Grange Road House and the tax office from Cornet Street. Uh, the tax office has been in Cornet Street since, well, a long time ago. I'll use that as a terminology. You know, um, and quite rightly, culturally, their businesses and their processes and their personal understanding adapted to that environment and how they work. They now sit in a single open plan office in Fossard House. You know, that is a major, major cultural change for someone who's perhaps been there for 20 or 25 years. It's not just making the decision, it's helping and supporting the team through it and beyond it. You know, we, we moved the entire tax office, there was no outage on any IT system and they closed down on Friday and they were operating uh, by 9 o'clock Monday morning. You know, it isn't necessarily technology, it's the human factors but it has to be driven by leadership at all levels. And if the leadership isn't there, actually, it's just words. Any other questions? Um, I was just wanted to follow up a little bit on, um, we touched a little bit on skills, but maybe to follow up um, the, the point, um, as um, Deputy De Leon mentioned at the beginning, there was a survey that um, went out to all the attendees by Eventbrite, but there was also a survey that went out to all the speakers, and um, one of the questions was, uh, what do we need to invest in Guernsey sort of PLC, as well as the skills side, what sort of skills are we looking for? And what was fascinating was what came back was not just, there, were, there was some indication, yes, we need the data analytics, we need coding, but there was a whole piece on creativity and entrepreneurialism. Um, and interestingly, one of the things that Guernsey does better than quite a lot of jurisdictions is its amazing music program. Um, so the last thing you probably thought we'd talk about was how fantastic the school's music service is. But um, it's just one example where creativity in Guernsey is allowed to really um, percolate up to quite um, amazing levels in terms of the talent level that they get to. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that entrepreneurial creative side and um, maybe design thinking, which came through as well as something that's important um, in terms of both, both at school age but also among your staff? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the... One of the Guernsey's been really adaptable over the years. I think what you see, one industry collapses and a new one emerges, and I really see our kind of key competitive advantages that we have time, um, time to think, because, you know, we don't really have commutes. Most people leave quite early, and actually a lot of the innovation happens, you know, walking on the beach and doing all these kind of things and understanding that there's a key component of that time to learn music, time to be involved in extracurricular, and you look at the explosion of wonderful things that happen in the community, here as a result of that time. That's where the kind of engine of our creativity is coming from. Yeah, and sure, um, and, and, and the talent from our creative sector, the only, the only crying shame that I see is all of that talent, or a lot of it is happening in spare time, rather than as much of it could be happening in core time in terms of how we drive in the economy with that talent, because a lot of people are stuck in jobs they don't, wouldn't normally want to do because of the high cost of living, is how can we get more of that talent into the day-to-day -day work, and part of creating these, these new systems, these new platforms, is that we're going to be able to create new industries, new ways of doing things that are going to use these skills much more. But I think we already have them. We're just not necessarily growing the right sectors yet to do that. Um, I suppose, um, for, for me, 
the thing I worry about is that I, I think necessity is the, the, the mother of invention. And um, I completely agree with what Mark was saying about um, historically Guernsey, and I have to say Jersey, have, uh, have managed to reinvent themselves many, many times over the years. I mean, if you actually take a step back and think about it, we're basically on a lump, lump of granite with practically no um, natural resources, uh, and yet we have one of the highest standards of income and livings in the world. Um, so, you know, as, as, as a society, we have been very inventive, and there have been absolutely points back in history that you can identify where something worked for a long time and it stopped working, and that necessity kicked in to try and find the next new thing. And actually, uh, all the, I think all the islands, certainly Jersey and Guernsey w w within the Channel Islands, have had those challenges and have had, found, found new things to do. Um, the thing I worry about is, back to my sort of frog in a pot of water, is, um, and, and Mark's sort of uh, exponential increase in change, is that thing that says, Will we realize we have a need to change and have the time to change? So, you know, sort of shock horror, I do have a view that at some point in time in both Jersey and Guernsey, the, the current sort of um, financial services age that we're in, that's currently lasted about 50 years, it's got to come to an end at some point in time. It would be nice to think that when it comes to an end, it will be a sort of gentle glide path down and there'll be lots of time and notice and we'll be able to, to find something new. But in the kind of disruptive worlds that we, 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 we're in today, I'm not sure it will be like that. Um, so I do think it's urgent uh, that, that there's an urgency about this. And uh, if I'm brutally honest, I, beyond what I've said about what we're doing in our own company, and we, I've talked enough about that so I won't bore you again, uh, I, I'm not sure I've got any other kind of great societal solutions for that. I think um, th there's always an issue of strategic shocks. Uh, we used to, when I was uh, um, the strategic, well, strategic planner for the MOD, we talked about strategic shocks a lot, you know, what could happen if, you know, um, and there was lots <coughs> of uh, blue sky thinking, which was great. Certain type of people forget why certain things happen, which then have a lead on effect. You know, uh, a lot of things are going on, whether it's right or wrong about in the Middle East, uh, are drawn back to 9-11, but that fact is forgotten. You know, the fact we're pouring still loads of money into uh, RBS and the other banks that we owe as taxpayers is because if we didn't, all the cash machines would have stopped working. You know, that's a practical, you know. So we need to understand the cause and then the long-term tail of strategic shocks. Um, but, you know, to end on a positive note, uh, I was very fortunate on Saturday night to attend the Guernsey Press um, you know, Pride of Guernsey Awards, you know, um, and you just hear some of the stories of what people are doing from, you know, the Teacher of the Year, Neighbour of the Year, Parent of the Year, uh, which was the most amazing one, which uh, uh, Sarah Groves' parents won. You know, actually, for 60,000 people, as Graham said, sitting on a rock with no natural resources, we punch massively above our weight. My personal view is we will only fail if we convince ourselves we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. And actually, we're not there. We need to convince ourselves and have a little bit more courage in our convictions of where we're taking ourselves for our children and our grandchildren, and we will win. The moment our heads go down, you're going to lose. This island is not going to lose. Well, I think there's a note to end on. Thank you very much to our panelists and for speaking this morning. Mark Wynn, Graham Miller, and Colin Bowden. Thank you. And now we have a coffee break. <laughs>